Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Europe Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program Forum. We're, we're get, looking for some more chairs for you. Um, this is a great turnout, so thank you for coming. So um, I'm briefly going to just give you these people's names, and I'm going to let them take it away and tell them what they'd like to about themselves and, and their area of expertise. So Mike Dwyer from Geography, Catherine Alexander from the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, and Adam Lisbon from the library. This is our Japanese and Korean <laughs> librarian. So, wow. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Dwyer. I am an instructor in the geography department. And um, what I do is, um, I'm not teaching, I spend as much time as I can working in Southeast Asia. And I'm going to show you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I work in mainland Southeast Asia, mostly in Laos and Cambodia, and I study land politics. And associated with that, if you put those two words together, you get a lot of the things that are wrapped up in geography, um, and specifically in human geography, where you have um, landscapes, places, the ways that people use land, the way that people understand those different uses of land, and all of the struggles over this is my land versus this is your land, um, all, the, all the debates that go along with economic development, um, with the ways that history impact um, contemporary social relations, and things that um, tend to coincide with um, essentially international dynamics, national policy, and nat national level history, and then local, you could say, village or county level processes as well, sort of all coming together in one place at one time. Um, and most of the work that I do is focused in northern Laos, and um, to a lesser extent, I have a second field site area in northern Cambodia. Um, the, the things that animate my work are land deals that are typically allocated by national governments to big companies um, on lands that are being used by rural communities, but that are officially owned by national communities, and often in the form of national governments. Um, and this is one way that these kinds of land deals are often represented. Um, this is a very, uh, you could say, um, it's a caricature of the kinds of things that happen, but this is reflecting a process where Com where companies from different countries, often through bilateral negotiations between governments, are getting access to pretty large um, areas of land. How those, how those accesses actually work, whether the companies get all the land that they're promised, all these things lead to research questions that I go out and study in the field. Um, most of my work um, is uh, based in Laos. I initially went to Laos um, in the mid-2000s trying to study debates about um, building dams on the Mekong River, and I got both pulled into the land use um, and land politics debates that go with agriculture and road building at the same time as I was pushed away from studying anything to do with energy or rivers because it was too politically controversial. And I wanted to be able to publish and go to conferences with my Lao colleagues who were teaching universities there, and so it essentially came down to a choice between the thing that I initially wanted to study and being able to have a social life as a researcher. And so I was like, okay, there's plenty of interesting stuff in, in this other land issues. I still got to study the kinds of development politics and problems and questions that I wanted to study, but um, it was a little bit more doable. And I've, in the last five years or so, the topics that I was initially hoping to study have come around um, to a little bit more public debate. And so I'm, I'm involved in um, natural resources having to do with energy and forests and agriculture sort of all at the same time. Um, these are the kinds of landscapes that I work in, um, pretty amazing rural spaces. Um, most of what um, I've done focusing on my, my field work on is in mountainous parts of uh, northern Laos that are called upland areas where you have the same, um, this is dry, dry rice that's being grown, and a lot of the ways that people farm rice in this part of the world are being targeted for replacement by other forms of land use that are seen as more developed. This, this has a long history in colonial policy and um, various types of forestry, um, science as being seen as uh, deforestation and degradation, 
And so a lot of these new big land deals are allocated <coughs> on precisely these landscapes and the kinds of policy struggles and um, social movements that come up in response to these um, have to do with questions about what's the proper way to use landscapes like this. One of the main things that I study is um, the, uh, the policy process that actually sort of hit the ground in villages through things that involve mapping. Because whenever you get a map, you mean you get um, a process where at a particular place in time, somebody's going to try to do something with the land. And so I use maps as ways into these processes and debates. Um, another thing that I use is new roads, because nothing brings development and land deals like infrastructure. Uh, this is a road that was is now fully paved, but this was being um, carved out of um, mountainsides, and you can see they're slumping down um, at the time that I was doing fieldwork in the mid-2000s. Uh, this is a road that goes between um, southern China and northeastern Thailand and connects two of the biggest regional economies in the region um, and through a fairly, at least formerly, remote part of northwestern Laos. And so the kinds of things that I was studying were plantations that look like this that bring Chinese rubber companies into these upland rice landscapes um, and lead to very different dynamics. Um, in some cases, I'm going to skip that slide and come back. Um, uh, sorry, in some cases you get things like this, which is basically where the company gets all of the land um, and people lose their land. And if you look off on the horizon, you can sort of see where the farming has been displaced to. And unfortunately for the people who live there, not only do they have to walk a long time, but it's also in a national park. So they've had their livelihoods criminalized as part of this development process. Um, and then on the other hand, some communities basically get to do whatever they want. Um, this is a picture that shows, on the one hand, the map underneath it was the government coming into this village and saying, you will do this with your land, you'll farm here and this way, you'll farm there and that way. And they basically were powerful enough um, that they put up they basically said, we can ignore this. This was a symbolic version of them saying, you know, we're not going to do what your map says. Um, and so one of the things that I do as a researcher is I try to explain the differences between communities who have a fair amount of power and agency in situations like this versus communities like this who lose a lot of their land. Um, and so what that means for me as a researcher is that I do ethnography and interviews, but I also do historical research and I try to read between the lines when people are telling me about this is why this happened um, in order to connect the kinds of historical processes that make some communities fairly empowered as citizens and, uh, and leave other communities relatively powerless. All right, so I begin a little bit existentially. Who am I and how did I end up here? Um, Professor Barry introduced me as Captain Alexander. I'm in the Department of Asian Languages and Civilizations. Um, and so I have been, I specifically work on pre-modern China. And my broad focus of the courses that I normally teach in, aside from when I teach all of Chinese history and culture, which I'm also teaching this semester, is courses that had, uh, go for about the last 600 years of Chinese history and literature up until right about 1900. That's my cutoff point. Um, personally, however, I research a very narrow genre of literature, um, religious popular literature from the 19th century, and I look at how it was involved in sort of social and moral reconstruction of China during and after a major civil war. You can forget all that for a moment. Let's backtrack. How did I end up here? Right? How did I end up in this little 30 year <coughs> piece? So this is the kind of boring curriculum vitae information that tells you how did I get from being an undergraduate somewhere to sitting in front of you today as an assistant professor. I went to college at Beloit College in Wisconsin. If you haven't heard of it, that's fine. It's about 1,200 students. It's very cold. You can also tell that Beloit College is in Beloit, which means there's not a whole lot else in the town other than the college. Uh, I double majored in East Asian languages and cultures and physics. These are the kinds of weird things you can double major in when you go to a tiny liberal arts college and there's nothing else to do but study. Um, from there, I went on to graduate school at the University of Chicago. I was in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, and I did my master's degree and my PhD there. After which, I came here to Colorado, where I'm in the Department of Asian Languages and Civilizations. You can sense a theme here. This is how I ended up where I was, right? 
and I continue to work on China. The thing is, though, that this doesn't explain to you why, in the first place, as an undergraduate, I was doing Chinese, first of all, and why I stuck with it. And for something like that, we have to think about research being something that's motivated by personal interest, right, and personal curiosity. And, you know, we'll talk about research, you want to make sure that you are objective and you're not sort of leading the research in the way that you want it to. But that doesn't mean that research isn't itself a fundamentally personal thing. And so for me, to end up being really interested in sort of obscure popular literature that sort of like the aunties and some women would have been listening to and reading in the 19th century, we have to go back to why I find sort of that marginal, like not the famous people, but the kind of like average people, why do I find that particularly interesting when it comes to studying China? And that comes back to, well, this. I was born and raised in Taiwan. And so I grew up speaking Mandarin and speaking Taiwanese. I grew up living a normal everyday life of like a little Taiwanese kid. And when I graduated from high school, you can tell that still, even though I was in an American school, I was constantly surrounded by Chinese language, by Taiwanese culture, by traditional forms of Chinese culture that are also present in Taiwan. And um, from the time that I was in preschool with all these little kids, I was learning to speak and read and write Mandarin. And so for me, I came to university having kind of a personal interest in the language and having a personal sense of like, well, you know, I, I lived in Taiwan. I sort of know how culture works. But it's the kind of thing like where you actually like start to want to question like, well, why do we do the things that we do? Why do we celebrate this holiday? Why does this temple down the street from my house behave in the way that it does, right? And so stuff like that for me was really a motivating factor of research. A motivating factor to take me from, well, I guess I study, I speak Chinese, to being like, well, but I want to know more, right? I want to read more stories. I want to hear more about the past. So what do I work on and why? How do we get from this to working on a very narrow field of Chinese literature? And that comes from all of those different steps in academia where I was, right? As an undergraduate, you study big, broad things, right? You learn the big pictures. You might have one or two classes on like a specific genre of literature or a specific novel. And that's really compelling and interesting, right? But what you're doing there is you're reading a lot of sort of secondary sources. You might read the primary source, but you're not generally, unless you're part of like a UROP grant, right? You're not generally producing original research. Right? You're not asking questions about what can I add to the field. You're just like, I need to get to know the field. And so once I was in graduate school, it was like, okay, well, what do I actually care about, right? Now it's time for me to figure out how do I fit into something like this. And what I always found out is that I'm really interested in narrative, and I'm really interested in stories. And I think that stories are incredibly powerful things, right? That when we look at stories, we're talking about how people kind of shape and reshape their reality. Um, and particularly in times when things are difficult, those stories have a lot of weight that perhaps something that is you know, a strict factual account of the events wouldn't have that level of emotional weight. So when I look at the work that I do, I'm really looking to kind of meet people in the past. Right? And so in graduate school, I got awfully sick of something that I think that you might have, some of you might also have gotten sick of, is that I was very tired of reading books written by highly educated men from ancient China that were filled with inside jokes for other highly educated ancient men of China. And like, those are funny, right? But like, that's like the 1% writing for the 1%, and the only reason that I could get that joke was because somebody thankfully footnoted the thing for me, right? When I think about like, okay, if I really want to study China in the past, I actually want to know more. And how can I know more if I'm just reading like the classic, classic, classic works? How can I expand my, out, my uh, lenses outwards? 
So for me, I hit upon this genre of popular Chinese religious literature and found that there was a gap in the research regarding this literature from the 19th century. So how do I go about researching it? I do three things. I read very broadly, right? I read all about this whole genre to figure out I'm really interested in this genre, I'm really interested in how this gets me outside of those dudes, right? Like, yes, like, maybe a bunch of other guys were writing this, but like, these sorts of things were meant to be read aloud to groups of women who were probably illiterate themselves. That's pretty cool, for me at least. I'm, I don't have pictures of the outdoors, I just, I brought a book. Um, so, reading very broadly, right? Um, getting a sense of like, what does the whole broad picture look like? And that kind of reading broadly is slow and painstaking, but what it does is it sets you up for seeing where the gaps are and seeing where the little things that you discover are actually discoveries, because you know that nobody's talked about them yet. And then once I have found something that I identified as something that was really interesting, this period of a massive civil war in China, and realizing that suddenly lots and lots of people were publishing and printing and distributing these kinds of religious texts during and after that war, I was like, okay, now I need to read that area very closely. And finally, what I do in the sense of reading closely, I also do print history and bibliography. And this is where I'm going to show you a whole lot of pictures of books and show you a book. Okay. Now, bibliography is not just the thing that you put at the end of a paper when you're done, right? And you're like, okay, which do I do, MLA style or whatever. Bibliography is actually the study of book history itself and print history. And why I had a life-changing class in graduate school, and like the first day the professor like trundles in this cart, and she's like, okay, here's a book from 800 years ago, I want to pass it around the room and look at it. I'm like, oh, what? And she's like, no, it's fine, I cleared it with the librarians, it's okay. Um, so, I'm not going to pass this around. <laughs> um, but I just want to show you, so, this is pretty unassuming, right? This is from Norlin, it was printed, let me get this date absolutely correct, in 1753, so this book is older than the United States of America. Now, I'm holding it in my hands. This is my huge history nerd moment, right? Because when you do print history and when you do bibliography, you're not just looking at the words on the page like the words that somebody wrote down and then I'm going to like micro-interpret it. You're also looking at a product that was designed and manufactured, right? There were a lot of decisions that went into the process why did somebody put this kind of paper here? Was this book actually rebound at some point? Right? Let me look at the front page and see, there's the date, okay, there's the title. Do I, does it tell me where it was printed? Oh, yes, it does. Okay, what else was going on in that time and place? Sometimes there's other information. And so when I do the bibliography and print history, even if somebody never wrote about themselves, right, because they weren't famous enough to, I still get to think about the choices that they made, and I get another level of insight into this time period. Yeah, so uh, my name is Adam Wisman. I'm the Japanese and Korean Studies Librarian, and I'm kind of like mm, the black sheep up here because I don't have a PhD, and I actively fought doing any kind of research whatsoever for most of my life. So, um, so I'll kind of give you the origin story. I uh, majored in Japanese in undergrad, and then there's not much you can do with just an undergraduate degree in Japanese, but I did the JET program, which if you don't know what this stands for, it's Japan Exchange and Teaching. Um, an amazing experience. And while I was on that program, I volunteered randomly to be a librarian uh, in Japan, of all places. And that was kind of the spark that led to eventually going to graduate school after refusing to go for the first two years I returned to America. Uh, but I got tired of working in retail and teaching ESL, so I, I wanted something else. So I went and got my master's degree, uh, so I just did a two-year degree, so PhD programs are, what, six, seven years? I was Ten in years. grad school for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I wrapped up in two years and became a professor anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and it was never part of my vision. So actually, uh, what is unusual about me is there are only 55 people in North America that do my job. Um, and of those 55 people, there are four that do research. So when I publish, I'm essentially publishing for four people. Um, but uh, I just had, it was never a part of my vision. Myself. 
And even when I first got here, I, you know, the research requirement came with that, but I really didn't quite understand what it was for. So I'm also a professor and a librarian, a light dancer. Um, uh, I really had to kind of discover my research just when I got here on the job with a timeline to wrap up my research in seven years so I could get tenure. Um, and what, we, what librarians do study is we study you, we study professors, so you guys are the objects of our research actually in a lot of instances. For me right now, um, there are only 55 people that do my job. There is very little energy and effort and put into making our jobs efficient. So the first big challenge that happened when I got my job was nobody could manage me. And I don't mean writing a book cart in a toga with flame, but uh, my supervisor, I'm the only person in the library that can read and write and speak Japanese. So no one else can handle me. They don't know what to do with me. They don't understand sort of the Japanese publishing world. They don't understand why collection development happens the way it does. I'm kind of this lonely island of sorts. And so it really opened my eyes to this idea of how to make new employees at an organization successful. So I got really involved with onboarding. And if you've never heard the term onboarding for it, it's similar to orientation, but orientation is when, like, here's your keys, here's your health insurance if you have a really good job, here's your uh, eco pass, here's your university ID, go forth. Um, you're not good at your job because you have those things, they're nice, but they, they're, not, they're not a skill set that you learn. Onboarding is about building a skill set up and making you as productive and successful as possible as fast as possible. And I found that there was this huge gap for me and everyone else because everyone was like, we don't know what to do with you. So I actually uh, collaborated with another colleague and we wound up doing a huge amount of research inside the library. So libraries often research themselves. There's a reason why we still exist in the age of Google and it's because we're constantly looking at ourselves, looking at how people interact with us, and looking at what you need and what you interact with, and understanding how you value information in 2017 as opposed to how students value information in 1999. I, for example, have very few issues with students using Wikipedia. A certain way to use it, but I think it's a great tool to use in your research arsenal. Um, scandalous, I know. I also have some really controversial and liberal ideas about citations, but uh, it's another we'll talk for another time. But, uh, but that became part of my research agenda. And so my second paper was actually, uh, I got really interested in um, bias in software. So uh, when software is designed, uh, people think of computers as these uh, unemotional and objective things, but they are created by people with biases, uh, by people with biases and predispositions. And so a lot of software is designed from the ground up to function in a monolingual English environment. And this creates a lot of different um, problems in small and different ways. So I got really involved in, has anybody heard of like Zotero or EndNote or RefWorks? Um, th these tools that help you sort of like save and manage the sources for your research. And it was really troubling because when I cite sources, I need the Japanese, but I also need to romanize it. So I essentially have two titles, but the software is only designed to have one title. Um, and so there's this fundamental bias in how the world is constructed and framed and how languages are represented. And that really bothered me. So I wanted to write a paper on it because I wanted essentially a piece of activism so I could go yell at companies to redesign their software from the ground up. So that, that, that phase of research is coming later. Um, and then the research I did after that is I'm actually analyzing workflows of East Asian studies librarians and trying to figure out how to automate them. So I'm involved in a bit of light programming and I have a lot of fun with it because it's kind of like trying to solve a puzzle. So, for example, uh, not to go too deep, but a lot of collection development is either automated, semi-automated, or the selection process is just like, here's all the things, <coughs> clicks, and it, it just all goes into the ether and takes care of itself. That is not the case for me. My mailbox is overflowing with packets of catalogs from Japan for different things to buy. And it's really laborious to have to do that. And again, I'm the only one that speaks Japanese in the library, so when I do a purchase order, I have to transliterate everything and give it to people who cannot speak Japanese so that they can place the orders. So I was like, this is ridiculous. I didn't get a master's degree to come work here to spend my day professionally copying and pasting. So it was taking hours of my time. There was no way I could have a successful career at working at the pace I was at. So I was like, this is ridiculous. So I spent an entire semester learning to automate the process, and I took what took, you know, four hours and got it down to about 20 minutes. It's a pretty good work game. And so uh, the next phase of that research is, and I've just written yet another uh, manuscript about that, and my next phase is I want to start holding workshops with my colleagues across mm -hmm. the country to sort of show them how they can create their own workflows, because 
programming is a pretty high barrier to cross, especially as you get older and more settled into your career. So how do you do that in a way that's accessible for people? Um, and, and, and every librarian works in a very different environment. They work with different software. They have different people they need to communicate with. The way you communicate and accomplish what you need to do happens in different ways. And so, um, so those are the topics I'm really interested in because it's just really, it's a really malnourished area of study, especially inside. Uh, for, every, for every topic in the mono-English world, there's no articles about it in the CJK experience, in the East Asian library experience. So how do CJK librarians help students? There's like three articles about it. But if it's history, there's hundreds. So I'm really interested in, like, in closing that gap, and that's kind of where my research is. And it's personal to me because I struggled in undergrad. I almost failed out of college, actually. I was a D student uh, for, I, I started with A's, and then it just declined into D's by the end of my sophomore year, and through some really amazing and wonderful mentors um, who really advocated for me, despite my terrible GPA and grades, uh, I got to study abroad in Japan. It was a life-changing experience, and I, closed out my senior year with nothing but A's. Um, so when we talk about like the power of education and all this kind of stuff, um, if I didn't have my bachelor's, I couldn't have done JET program. If I didn't do JET program, I wouldn't have discovered librarianship. If I didn't discover librarianship, I wouldn't be doing research. If I wasn't doing research, I wouldn't be sitting here. So it's actually a research question I haven't started yet, and there's a couple of boring behind the scenes reasons I haven't done it, but I've slowly been sort of building up in the background because um, when you work with people, there's a lot of like ethics issues, and especially students really bad about showing up for like a research interview or like a focus group where you're trying to gather data. Um, but I ended on uh, saying that I struggled a lot in undergrad, and, and uh, honestly, I didn't use the library at all, and now I'm a librarian. <laughs> um, and so I'm really interested in terms of students who are studying Japanese language, how they view and think of, not necessarily just the library, but sort of how they deal with the process of gathering information to overcome uh, barriers to their learning. I'm sure all of you have taken language classes at some point, and you just hit a grammar point, and you're like, I do not get this. And I'm really curious about the strategies you employ, and I'm sure a lot of it is Google, um, but, but I'm really curious uh, when you're presented with new ways of approaching that information, how you react to it, and whether or not you adopt it as part of your uh, approach. And one of the reasons this is it hasn't taken off yet is I actually have to build up a data set. Uh, so I've been doing that for three years, so I have enough students to actually talk to to actually have valid results and sort of uh, implant seeds in them about how to accomplish uh, and overcome their challenges through library resources, and then see if they actually did it. And if they didn't, why? What were those barriers? Why won't students go to the library, why won't they adopt a workflow? Uh, is there an overemphasis on digital resources? Is it just too inconvenient? Is it, there's a real term called library anxiety. So students are really resistant to coming into the library, going into the stacks, talking to the librarian at the research desk. I constantly get, oh, I, I just don't want to bother you, you're so busy. I'm like, eh, everyone gets bothered all the time, whatever. Like, the thing that's gonna take you four hours, I can probably solve in four minutes, so it's your choice how you want to spend your time. Um, that's always how I sell my services to students, essentially. It is my primary job to help you, and I can assure you it's more interesting than like going through emails. So, I did a whole bunch of research with a few of these specific um, Bao Juan texts, these stories that were really, like, meant to be performed um, for audiences of women. Because, like I said before, you have to know the whole field, at least sort of the, the basic bits of the landscape before you can figure out when you found something really weird, and then you're like zero in on the weird thing, right? And so most of the texts that I look at look kind of like this. They just look like a regular book. I showed you a book like that just now. But one of these texts that I found from the exact same period instead looks like this. And what that means is that every single one of these pages has a bottom half with like the main story, like the main religious sermon text. And then a top half. And the top half is just filled with, as far as I can tell, like random stuff. And so I spent a few weeks last summer just like cataloging it. Like every time I find a subject heading, I write the subject heading down. So right at the beginning, what we have is a calendar 
and the top section goes on for a while with the calendar of all the different times you're supposed to offer sacrifices to different gods. Cool. The next thing that comes after it is um, a thing that talks about, like, these are all the countries of the world. And it begins with real countries, like places like Vietnam and uh, Korea and like places that are actually real. But very quickly goes into countries like, there's a country where there's all women. There's a country where they all have large heads. There's a country where everyone only has one leg. And you're like, no, these are not real countries. This is from the 19th century. Doesn't everybody realize by now that like, you can start off in Korea, but you can't go to one leg land? Um, and so there, there are 800 pages of this text. Um, and I've only just like barely scratched the surface of what is in there. I found, if this is supposed to be like Chinese religion, but I found a Christian tract about how wonderful Jesus is up in the top. <laughs> The editors later, in another edition, this is why I compare editions, had taken out and put something else in on top of it, because they're like, wait a second, how'd that work its way into our text? Um, there's songs that you should sing to your husband if he's a drunk and you want to convince him to stop drinking. Um, there's just, like, I just want to spend a whole bunch of time and just go through and figure out what on earth is going on up here, because right now it feels like whoever was printing the book just like was like, hey, why don't we add extra value by putting random things in the top? But there's got to be more to it, right? Like, when I think about an editor and the work that they do, they're making rational decisions. I've sort of figure out on what rationale they were functioning. <laughs> there's a whole section of medical literature in two of these five volumes, which include, you know, how do you treat various diseases. And um, one of the medical prescriptions calls for cat urine. And um, then there's a nice helpful note, just in case you don't know how to get urine from a cat, that you need to rub ginger on the cat's nose so it'll pee so that you can then treat your patient. So that's all from this thing. Yeah. Anyway. I'm going to talk about two projects, because I can't choose. Um, the, the project that I started telling you about before was my PhD research, and it was very much a project of the years of George W. Bush. Um, it was. The, the answer to the question that I sort of posed initially was, why does one village actually have somewhat active powers of citizenship and the other village doesn't? Um, when you get into that stuff, you move pretty quickly from development studies to Cold War history. And I traced those things through processes of people moving around within the landscape of Northern Laos, some voluntarily, some involuntarily. And what it comes back to is has a lot to do with what side of the so of the civil war um, you were perceived to have been on, and so that project was um, it was my first major research project in Southeast Asia. It was about legacies of American imperialism in Laos, and it was connecting those legacies to contemporary processes of uneven development where some communities do okay and other communities really don't. Um, and it felt like a really important project to be doing at the time that the U.S. was going abroad and having all kinds of interactions with local communities and trying to get communities in Afghanistan and Iraq to be mobilized in support of um, the particular side that they were on. And I saw a lot of parallels between what had happened in Laos and what I was seeing the legacies of 30 and 40 years later and what was being replicated um, in the Bush years. Um, and in some ways, Obama actually doubled down on that stuff as he um, withdrew from some of the really um, uh, more overt types of war that the US was doing and started relying more on special forces, which cooperates more with local communities. Similar types of stuff um, to, that had been pioneered under Kennedy um, during the, the secret war in Laos. So that's, pr that's probably my, my, my main answer. Um, but the, the thing that has gotten the most traction, and this is what I just want to show briefly, and this is the, um, the project that just, I guess you could say makes me the most mad, um, <laughs> it has to do with the geography of where land titles are handed out. And what you see here is a map of Cambodia, um, and in red you see representation of these very large land deals that are given to companies. And in the black, you see parts of the country where the government, with international donor support, has gone around and given out these things that you see an example of here on the left, which is a land title 
which formalizes the ownership of a piece of property where it's essentially the state comes to town and says, do you own this land? Do your neighbors think that you own this land? If so, here's a piece of paper that says, we acknowledge that you own this land. And what makes me so irate about this stuff is that they don't do these um, land titling programs in the parts of the country that need them the most. Um, and so what you see when you look at this map is basically there's a black zone and a red zone. And the places where land property rights are actually being formalized are the places where land rights are actually fairly secure already. And the re there, there's, there's a sort of a, a small handful of reasons why they're focusing on these areas. Um, but what I've been trying to do, and this is essentially the second project that I've taken on, has been to try to engage some of the policy rationales for why land titling happens the way it does in the places that it does in order to try to move that conversation about um, land titling toward rural areas. That does make me angry. Yeah. <laughs> it's hypocritical because like, they come to town with the concession and say, well, you don't have a land title, so we're going to take your Yeah, um, but um, and that's a, it's, a, it's a good question because the red data came about because a whole bunch of members of civil society did a whole lot of hard legwork and digitized things that are, that are actually published by the government because Cambodia actually has a similar law to the US that says if something is going to be legal, it has to be gazetted. And what it means to be gazetted is to be published in a gazette, but they make the gazette really hard to use, and so what activists in Cambodia have done is gone and picked out the Gazette you know, every month and gone through and pulled out maps from it, digitized them, put them online, coordinated them as a data set. That's the red data. The black data is even more interesting in that the black data is about where the World Bank has sponsored land titling, and that data was only released because of a fight within the World Bank, where some communities who were being excluded from land titling filed a claim with a World Bank internal watchdog that's called the Inspection Panel, and the bank in DC sent the Inspection Panel to Cambodia, and the Inspection Panel basically agreed wholeheartedly with what the communities had said. And so the bank office in Cambodia published this map to say, no, 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 we're working over here, we're not working over there where all the land conflict is. So this was published as a defensive move by one piece of an institution that otherwise would have probably not been very transparent about this. So part of what I use this, and the reason that I moved from Laos to Cambodia to try to study where land titling happened was because of this conflict, which produced this transparency. And so what I, a lot of the arguments that I try to have as a social scientist are with people who say, well, I want to see the numbers. And I say, I want to see the numbers too, but this is a case where the kind of numbers that you want to see were produced for exceptional reasons. And so this whole, there's a whole politics to what gets quantified and published. And that's, to me, what makes Cambodia interesting as a case study. That... No, they published, I mean, the, the bank itself published. The, no. <laughs> no, this data is in the public domain. And I'm not the one who published it, although I have, I put it together and published it. And the government doesn't really read journal articles or even, <laughs> I put this in a policy brief too, they don't read that either. Okay. I look at how they're using land and how much, and, and how and how they talk about it, and also how government, people in government talk about it. Um, so the, the, the obvious clue was that some communities had these big rubber concessions in the middle of them, and other communities didn't. Um, and so that was clue number one. And then when we went and started doing the interviews in the, in the village where they published this, where, where they had this, they also were, one, one of the, the most important interviews that we had was a local teacher complaining about how they thought we were there to study the environmental impacts of, of farming. and so there was a teacher who was complaining about how the members of his village just go and do and farm wherever they want. And that was a, that was a story that contrasted very starkly 
with this, which is where, in this case, people couldn't do whatever they want because they had a big foreign rubber project right in the middle of the land where they had previously been farming. So it's sort of putting together the clues that you get based on where people feel comfortable talking. And often, in, in the cases where you have people who will actually do what seems like a real interview and answer your questions with a lot of detail, those are people who feel safe. And it's in villages like this where they're pretty quiet, they don't say much, they're like, we're not really sure why you're here. So you have to do a lot of triangulating what you see, what contrasts with other places, and I do a lot of um, geo-referencing, so figuring out what had happened in this particular location. And not only this location, but this is a map that I skipped. Um, I use this map as, as a, a key to try to geo-reference different things that I was seeing um, within the landscape. And so one of the, the processes that I had to do in order to put the story together was to figure out where people had moved from and where they had moved to. And so this is an old map that was actually published by the US military in the 70s that shows the old um, secret war landing sites where the CIA and the private contractors were landing and saw the, all the little dots were the LS's landing site. And so reconstructing these histories of voluntary and involuntary resettlement in and knowing something about how this landscape had functioned previously and how those different groups were involved in the different sides of the war let me sort of put all that together. But a lot of it was pretty indirect. I wanted to add to that that like one of the things that really distinguishes professorial research from like undergraduate research is like the creation of data as opposed to like consuming data. And so to become a data producer takes an enormous amount of time and energy. One of the things that I try to do when I talk to people about research is to say, you don't have to get three years of language training in order to be able to say something meaningful about a particular context. Um, you can do multiple things. So in Laos, I stumble, like I can read Laos, so I can read maps. I can stumble really badly through conversations and interviews, enough to make people comfortable. And in order to get access to any of the people that I'm working with, I have a lot of collaborators. And so they do most of the speaking, and I do enough to, sh to basically prove that I'm not a CIA <laughs> you know, modern day yeah. incarnation. And um, working with, the, you know, it's a social process, as, as these folks were saying before. I don't speak any Khmer, so when I do work in Cambodia, I work with Khmer colleagues. And I spend a lot of time talking to foreign development professionals who don't speak Khmer either. Well, in terms of stuff to work with, uh, so one thing people don't realize is that we have a data management librarian. So data sets are a way of telling a story. So like GIS data, things like that. So working with these data to like tell stories, like what does the data tell us? So we have a data management librarian. So if you are interested in like businesses in Asia, uh, chances are pretty good that governments are producing data sets that you can work with to extrapolate from, things like that. And of course, working with primary text, which means we'll buy it for you, that kind of thing. Um, students don't realize this, but you can ask us to buy just about anything. I mean, if it's like $30,000, that might get a little complicated, but um, I fulfill those requests all the time. So um, uh, just be aware that the library is able to supply resources if we don't have them. <coughs> And you don't have to have a Europe grant to ask them. Yeah, to people are really guilty about asking for stuff. Even faculty are guilty, and it takes a lot of um, energy to get uh, graduate students working on their masters because that's that transitional phase where you're really starting to focus. So chances are pretty slim that we have like the exact set of manuscripts or monographs that a student needs to do the research they need to do, and then they hesitate to come to me. I'm like, oh, we could have done that like four months ago. It takes me only like. I don't know, five, I automated the process. It only takes me like five minutes to place the order. There's no skin off my back. So. so the research that I do with um, these kind of marginal literatures in 19th century China, um, if somebody had the Chinese reading skills to kind of get in and read those texts in the original, they're not that they're not meant for highly educated people, right? They're meant for somebody who has functional literacy. In fact, often they have like little pronunciation guides in them for somebody who like wasn't a very good reader but was going to be reading it aloud to the other people who were listening. 
And they're like, wait, I don't really know how to read this character, but I know that it rhymes with the more simpler character in the margin. So for somebody who had, let's say, four years of Chinese already, you could very easily search online, see if anybody's written a journal article about one of these stories before. And if they hadn't, you'd be reading something, and anything that you wrote would be an original take on this story that somebody hadn't looked at since the 19th century. That's a really easy way to find a new thing to do. Um, why is it interesting to do? Um, I mean, I find it utterly fascinating, in part because it's the kind of thing that, for most of time, people weren't even like bothering to save in libraries. Not until the early 20th century were people like, huh, maybe we should study things other than the best literature. Maybe we should study the more widespread literature. Maybe we should study literatures that like are weird and tell us about how to get pee from cats. <laughs> no, it's not usually like that. Usually there's stories about like a woman goes through a lot of suffering to make sure that she proves she's a good Buddhist, right? But that's a moral tale and she might have adventures along the way. Cool. So in that sense, it's, just, it's very easy to take part in something and add to our understanding of 18th century China, particularly the people who we haven't really spent much time studying yet, right? Like, Basically, everything I look at is a little is new. I have no one to talk about it with. Um, I, when I do find people to talk about it with, it's really cool. Um, I'm working on a translation myself of the Baoqian, and, and I like assigned it to some of my grad students, and then I bought them cookies, and then we sat and chatted about it. So it was like, I just want to talk to somebody about this, please. So um, that's that's the fun part, you know. Um, without having a huge reading knowledge of Chinese, it gets more difficult because not a lot of people translated these things yet. There are a few. That's cool. Um, and so come take a class with me and we'll probably read some because I'm using them in my classes. So I think they're really important. You know, there, are, there are a number of reasons why you should really think about doing research now as undergraduates. One, I mean, the Europe program is amazing. There are a lot of schools that do not have that kind of funding. And I would really encourage you guys to take a look, a close look at what's available. Um, like some of the grants, you get up like $3,000. You can go somewhere, you know, either in the United States or abroad, whatever, to do your research. Um, a lot of you, if you're, if you're, you know, juniors, seniors, you may be thinking, I can't wait to be done. I'm never going back to school. That's what I thought. <laughs> I thought that, and then five years later, I decided, well, I think I'll go to grad school. Um, and it Probably. helps set you apart. Whatever you all do, like chances are pretty good not all of you are going to be <coughs> university professors. Um, you know, it's not a fit for everybody. Um, but company, like, so before I was saying about like, I research myself, right? I, re I, I work in a library and I research libraries. That's what companies do. They research themselves. So having the capacity to do analysis and research, it's really important that you pick that up now because it makes you much more competitive. If you walk into a job interview and they're going to ask you, well, how are you going to get the information on this? And yours says, I'm going to Google it. They're not going to be impressed. <laughs> You've got to understand where information comes from, how it's built, why it exists in the first place, and how to generate it. And so this is an opportunity to develop that skill set now. They don't want to hear, oh, I'll Google it. And then, are, and then when, if you do get the job, are you going to put your job on the line for something you Googled? as opposed to using a professional information source. Like, that's how you need to think about this. Um, you need to know where, like, when we, like, if you've ever done, like, a library instruction system, they talk about, like, all these different databases. Those all vanish when you graduate. They disappear. You have no access to them. It's only your university affiliation that gives you access. So when you go into a job that's paying for it, uh, a database that used to be here and you're just not interacted with the sort of subject relevant set of information sources because it was just easier to Google it, you're at a huge disadvantage. You're a stunted employee at that point. So it's really important to like engage with the databases you have access to now because that information is arranged in a totally different way than how Google thinks about things. It doesn't just give you what's popular. If you can do two research projects, uh, you'll see that when you do the second one, it's so much easier. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because research has this learning curve where you go into it, you have something you're interested in, you collect some data, you're like, all right, this is this is going the way I want it. You collect a little bit more data and you're like, oh no, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and then you collect some more data and it all starts to fit together and you go through this process and coming out the other mm -hmm. side and seeing how you seeing how that works and having the going through a process, not I wouldn't say having the ability, you don't have the ability to do it a couple times. 
but going through a process where you actually convince yourself rather than just your boss that you have the answer to something, mm -hmm. then you can really believe it, then you can argue it, then you can say, this is how I did it, and that's a replicable skill that you can then take to just about any context. And it makes you not only um, a better, you could say, analyst or writer, it also I think makes you a way better reader um, because you're, you're looking for what, how are the arguments being put together, what's the evidence, um, and I think it's just a really good life skill. I don't think there's any research by what I haven't done where at some point I haven't been looking at a huge amount of self doubt like this question is garbage, I'm wasting my time, I'm going to lose my job because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, it, it's something that happens through your life. You, you grow, you take out more complex projects, you hit walls and you have to overcome them. That is basically your whole life. Sorry, it's not very romantic, but it's true. It's about overcoming new challenges every day. It's not like you do research because you know what's there. Right, you, you do research because you, know. you don't know what's there and you want to see what you're going to find. And maybe the question that you thought was that first question is actually like absolutely useless, but you find something else along the way that shows you something else to work with. Or the question that you discard at the beginning ends up popping back up again like a ghost to haunt you later and helping you out with a different project. <laughs>
Okay, well, thank you very much, and help yourself to the food and drinks, and if you want to stick around for a few minutes and talk to any of us, we're here.